five PowerShell one-liners that can help in a pinch. Hey, David, uh, Matt. So it looks like uh, this week we are going to be changing things up a little bit in Threat Track. So we're going to forego the normal covering of stories. And David, you've got uh, five PowerShell commands that we think that uh, folks will find useful. So take us through it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Manny. Yeah. So, uh, yes, yeah, so like you said, this week we're going to be covering these uh, five PowerShell commands. Um, you know, uh, they've been around. Some of them have for a while, and a lot of people do know about them. Uh, at different levels of, you know, uh, skills or abilities. Some people will have a little more experience with them. Some may not, and then some may not know about these at all. So I think, you know, when we look at these, these five commands are pretty helpful or useful. Uh, especially, let's say you're in a pinch and you don't have, a, let's say, a, a port scanner uh, installed, or you're on a site, maybe doing a pin test. Uh, you're missing some software, forget some, you don't have it. Initially, you need a quick way to port scan or a ping sweep or or certain things like that. The commands I'm going to show today that we'll, we'll cover uh, will help you, right? Again, uh, just a quick way, something quick initially out of the box that comes kind of with PowerShell to use these commands and, uh, you know, further your uh, investigations or, or you know, uh, analysis. So again, the five that we're going to be covering here are uh, is going to be a TCP port scanner. Again, uh, built into PowerShell. Uh, we'll explain that coming up. Uh, ping sweep the ability to uh, download a file, a file list download, and using the stream parameter, the stream switch on a, a get item command that will let us actually look at an alternate data stream uh, within a file. So what we're gonna begin with again is the TCP port scanner. Uh, it's just gonna be a, a covering a, a one-liner used to scan a range of ports. Here's the command and I'm gonna go from left to right. Uh, and uh, down here, you'll see I put in a, a little bit of some notes to kind of explain what it's doing. So basically, on the left-hand side, as we begin going again, moving from left to right, um, this is just going to be your port range to scan. So, you know, you could put in 1 to 50, 1 to 1,000. You can go to the max 65,000, you know, 535, or um, whatever range you want to put in here. The next command is going to be the pipe command, which I know some people are familiar with Linux or Unix, and even in Windows to certain commands. That's just saying, basically, your commands or the output from the command on the left-hand side, pipe it into the next set of commands or next set of actions you want to take. In PowerShell, the percent sign represents a for each object alias. And what it's going to do is basically also initiate the start of the loop. So everything here that's in the curly braces, as we see here, um, is going to be in a loop. The echo command is just going to echo what we return on our scan, the IP address, and then what ports open. And it's going to say open port if it does find an open port for the echo command, kind of like a print statement, just show it on the screen. The new object, which again, I know a lot of people, if you're a programmer or if you're not, even people are just in general understanding of object-oriented programming, um, is going to create an object or instantiate the object. So the object that it's going to instantiate is the system.net sockets TCP client. And as you can see, I put a little note down here, a little uh, information description. And basically that's just an instance of the uh, .NET TCP client. And it's used to make connections to uh, TCP ports. Continue on, the next part of it is gonna be the connect method, which again, we're connect to the particular IP address and then just scan it again with the dollar underscore, which represents the port numbers that we piped into it, or again, pushed into the actual loop. And it's going to just one by one, depending on how many port numbers we provided at the very beginning, just go through each one of those in a loop. And then if it finds one, it'll say, you know, open port and again, display that port number. And so basically that's it from the, the command itself. Um, and again, what, what I'm gonna do is basically, I'm only gonna use a, just for the sake of our, our presentation today or our demo today, a smaller, just a couple range so we can just get the, the, um, the context. Uh, I'm gonna use my IP address, just a local IP address for most of the stuff today. Everything's just gonna be local, simple uh, you know, commands on my local computer. So what we'll do now um, is I will give you just a quick demo of this command. And again, we're just going to show it in a, um, we'll, we'll do it in the command prompt. I know PowerShell does have a, a, a GUI, but um, just for um, the sake of, again, today's presentation or demo, we're going to use the actual Windows command line. But what we should be seeing now is the uh, command prompt. I'm just in a PowerShell um, prompt. And again, to start that, I just typed in PowerShell um, to start it. Um, and the command we're again, we're going to be running is this again, is the TCP port scanner. So when we look back again, this was that X dot dot xxx where I was putting. So this, I'm gonna scan from, again, uh, this port number 799 to 8002. And then once it finds a port that's open, it will say port is open. If it finds one that's not open in that same range or is blocked, 
you'll see you'll see a really red um, uh, message display. It looks kind of cryptic, but it's not. It's just basically telling you that that particular connection was refused or uh, you couldn't scan that port. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this one now and you'll see that what we did was, again, we started with port 7999. If you can see, no connection can be made because it's refused to that port number. When we get to port 8000, that is an open port currently running. And as you can see, so it says port 8000 is open. Again, that port number comes from the actual port numbers we piped in. And again, it's just displaying it right here. Port, the dollar sign underscore again, just means the actual input variables that you pushed into the actual loop um, or part of the pipeline. Port 8001 is open, they're definitely open. And then the next one again, 8002, as you can see, it's not open. And that's why we get this, you know, red. Basically, it's like an error message, basically, or accepts a message just saying, you know, it couldn't scan that particular port number on the computer. Interesting. So I guess let's compare this to something like Nmap, which I think most people would probably be their first choice for, for port scanning something. Like yes. you run an Nmap and it gives you much more output than this. It gives you the ability to tell, you know, is there a firewall filtering the port as opposed to the port is actually closed, uh, the ability to run scripts and all sorts of stuff. This is, on the other hand, very simple, but also if you are on a Windows box, you've got the ability to do this. You don't have to bring Nmap over and I know you mentioned pen testing before. If you're a pen tester and you're trying to pivot through a network, um, having to drag all your tools with you may not be something you want to do. Having to set up pivots through a box in order to run scripts may not be something you want to do. And this this gets you part of the way there, or most of the way there. If all you want to know is the port is open. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point, Matt. Yeah, you know, like and as you said, right? You know, you're not going to get as you said the the stealth capabilities, the banner grabbing, those additional tools of Nmap. But again, like you say, yeah, if just if you maybe forgot it or just in a pinch in a quick hurry, you need something right out of the box because, as we know, .NET is so heavily built into the Windows. This is just a quick again, the whole point of you know being a quick one liner to get you initially started. Yes, so definitely great point. Yeah, so I would I would imagine though that you probably would recommend not running this across all 65,000 ports, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, I probably should have prefaced that. Very good point. Yeah, you do not want to do that because, as you know, this is a good, this is a loud scan. So if you were doing that, you, you're gonna, you, you don't want to do that. Yeah, and that first of all, if we talk just from uh, functionality, uh, non, you know, security, that's gonna take a while, right? And you don't want to do that because that's just too much. Right. But if you do start hitting people or try to scan someone and you're not supposed to or you don't have authorization and you do that, then yeah, you're gonna the you'll be definitely uh, identified or notified and yeah you do not want to scan that whole range of ports exactly yeah yeah yep. and the out and the output's going to be ugly right i mean it's just oh yeah, there's no question the screen. <laughs> you're probably yeah. gonna have what but sixty five thousand of the exceptions right <laughs> unless you happen to find yeah. one yeah and, and again so the, for the commands today um you know the good thing about powershell 2 and is that although i'm going to show these simple one-liners and, and and you know they stop here um, you could take this further even to continue on and use additional formatting, uh, selecting certain strings where you could actually format to get rid of a lot of this. But, you know, just for kind of our context and today, just kind of wanted to show what it does look like. But you could definitely, you know, format that out as well, too. But, yeah, if you run it like this, what you don't want to do, as you say, the, the 65,000 you know, ports, yeah, it would be really uh, nasty looking and, and you wouldn't want to do that for sure. Okay, so continue on for our, our next command. What we're going to cover is a, a ping sweep. And, you know, same as kind of the port scanner, which is going to be a one-liner used to ping, ping a range of IPs. Now, um, when we continue on, I'm going to show you um, when I do the actual uh, demo, um, I'm going to keep a real small number um, because, you know, just for the sake of the and context of the presentation, you'll get you to put, bring the point home. But, you know, we don't want to scan a whole bunch of, uh, you know, uh, IPs for, you know, and take this way too long for our, our topic of today. So I'm um, looking at the ping sweep. Uh, again, it's going to be a ping command. Now, granted, we can run straight ping in, you know, in the Windows command prompt or even in a Linux or Unix. And then also um, <clears throat> we can, uh, you know, run it even in a batch loop without even a separate file. So you can do a for loop within a Windows command prompt that will kind of do the same thing. But again, because for today we're talking the sake of PowerShell, what is great about the ability of PowerShell is the fact that we can add these um, variables or values in the beginning and pipe it into that um, command. So um, kind of like our last one, the port scanner, uh, we're going to basically do the same thing is pipe it into a loop and just, you know, loop through that particular set of um, host IP values or uh, numbers that we're going to um, pass into the pipeline and just display it out and ping it. 
So again, not really too much different per se from a straight ping, but the thing about it is the fact that we can uh, put in a range of numbers instead of just, you know, pinging a IP address, you know, one at a time, unless you put it in like a, a batch file itself. So again, continue with the same um, this, um, explanation as we did in the last in the port scanner. We're just gonna go from right to left. So again, the X, the XXX is basically the um, IP number or that you wanna, you know, ping. Uh, once again, the port sign just basically says it's an alias for the for each object. So it's a for each loop, starts the loop as well. Again, echo is going to echo out whatever we have in, uh, you know, double quotes here. So it's going to re-echo out the actual um, IP that we're scanning. And then again, it's going to ping it later. So <clears throat> that's what the dollar sign underscore are. Again, that represents the values here. These two dollar sign are the values that we're passing into the actual pipeline or the loop. And then... Once we're done passing that in, we're going to basically ping it with the count of five and then wait for a, a five second timeout because uh, the dash W is in milliseconds within Windows. So pretty much everywhere, right? But it's milliseconds. So we're gonna wait basically five seconds and then um, ping the uh, final IP address, which is what we passed into it. So again, this is just gonna echo what we passed into it. And this is gonna ping the same actual IP address. So this one again is not too much different from a normal ping command you would run. But again, the fact that makes this one a little bit, you know, a little better is the fact that we can do this pipelining and this for each with the actual set of values as the IPs we want to scan. So David, this one is when you pass in those the X's there, you're actually just passing in the last octet, right? You've already decided what the rest of that IP address is going to be. Correct. Yeah, you, that's correct, Matt. You could be a little more advanced if you wanted to, like even before this, you could set up uh, variables that do each individual octet and use mm -hmm. those. But yes, correct. Just for this, for you know, like just to get the, the basic understanding, yes, I'm gonna basically uh, pass in some, a uh, couple of, you know, just a few in here and then probably just three and I'll show you. And then you'll see the fact that it will expand those or, uh, you know, sign those here and then just go through each one. Gotcha. Yep. But yeah, you definitely could, you know, make this a lot more uh, advanced or complex with, you know, uh, other octets as well, yes. What we're going to do is, again, we're just going to take, as I mentioned in the actual explanation of the command, we're going to use just um, the octet one through five. And again, that's just going to be 127.0.0.1. And then, you know, two, three, four, five. And it's just going to ping that, um, you know, each time. So as you can see, it echoes out the, the IP address with the octet we're doing. And then just again, we're just looping through one. We're going to go to two, three, four and five. And then it'll stop. And again, each one, as we said, in the count and that n uh, parameter, the n5 parameter, which is going to say again, just ping it five times. And so again, that's that's it. And again, uh, nothing on this particular command. Uh, you may ask, you know, well, it's you know, again, not too much different from just pinging an IP. But again, they, the the point is when you're running through PowerShell, the ability to have this looping construct and pass in variables or values into this particular for each loop gives a little more, you know, capability um, than just having to say, you know, ping yourself manually a particular IP address. And then as I mentioned, and as Manny, Manny asked earlier, you can actually pipe this out to additional select strings and formatting commands that you can make this even uh, nicer output. You could, you know, exclude the reply. You could, uh, well, I mean, you want one of the replies at least, but you could maybe sum, sum that to where you get a count of how many replies or the actual time, the actual bytes. You could actually pull these out in subsequent commands as part of this one pipeline to make a lot more, you know, uh, beneficial or, or less, you know, uh, make a little cleaner on the output. Okay, so continue with our next command. This will be the third command out of the five we're going to show today. Um, uh, this is a, a download file. And basically, again, as it's kind of the nature of the whole discussion, today, just a one-liner again used to download a file. Um, when we look at that command, not really too much involved with it. Um, basically, we're going to um, have the new object create or instantiate that object. We're going to use, in this case, the .NET web client, which as I have listed here, just for, you know, if you need to uh, look back later, is basically used to just receive data from a resource or a URI. Um, <clears throat> so um, the method that we're going to use is download file. Again, just downloads a file. We're going to use, a, uh, in this case, a scheme identifier. So you can, as I have listed here, you can use HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, or, you know, the file command. Those are the four of the ones that are kind of default in the .NET or that it accepts or recognizes, you know, out of the box. And so we're going to today basically use an HTTP. We're going to download that and then place it into a file name on our computer. So 
Um, the benefit of this one is basically, you know, you can even use this um, to have the ability to download a file within a command or script. You know, maybe you have an automated script that runs that you're using, need to download certain uh, lookup files or other parameters to then further do additional uh, scripting or actions by having the ability to download a file instead of having you know, open up a web browser or uh, another uh, like when, a, when uh, SFTP or SFTP GUI. Um, you don't have to do that. You can have the ability to download that within the action that you're using within the script and then continue on and use whatever resource you downloaded. So that's kind of the beneficial part of this. It's pretty simple in its use, but the fact that you could use this command to have you, again, download um, certain uh, files or lookup tables that you see or need fit during your script or your automated process is really helpful and beneficial. So now we're going to just show our demo of the, um, the download file. Again, simple download, the method of the web client, the .NET web client, download file. What we're going to do is just uh, basically a link from our att.com site. We're just going to pull up our channel lineup for our DirecTV uh, lineup um, or DirecTV's lineup. Again, all I'm going to do here is basically take this particular PDF file, download it from the site, and then just write it into my directory that I'm currently in and then with the actual uh, name I want to name it. Now, of course, if you try to write this into a directory you don't have permissions to, it's going to fail. So if you're wanting to use this and you're running to an automated script, you want to make sure that the directory you're trying to write to does have permissions. Because, again, it will fail if you try to write it to somewhere you don't have permissions or access. So when it runs, you don't really get any responses. Now, you can tailor this web client a little bit more to add some additional responses. But, again, um, it did download, and I'll show you here. I'll just do a DIR and show you that we do have it downloaded. You can see um, the current time and central time um, and um, the channel line. So that's where I named it here. So, again, we're downloading the actual name of the PDF from the site or the anything you want to download in the in your if you're using a script or any uh, the command by itself. And, again, this is the file name that I renamed it to when it was downloaded. Now, uh, the web client has been around for a while. Um, I think they're going to be pushing, try to push people more to the HTTP client, which is some newer version and some newer handling. But um, this is still around and does its use basically in a simple single one-line command to download a file. And as you saw, it was pretty simple, right? Put the command in, specify what you want, put a name on it if you want a name, and then or a rename of the file that you want it to be, and then um, it saves it. Uh, the other part is there's an invoke web web request that I'll show on the next one, which is slightly different. But again, for this particular demo and this particular action or command, it's just a simple download file. The first thing that comes to mind is, can you provide this same uh, method? The Say, if you've got a, a, a filtering proxy somewhere in the network, uh, can you teach this method uh, to, to abide by it and provide credentials to it? Or is it or does it just rely on what's configured already in Windows for the currently logged in user? Yeah, another great question, Matt. Yep, you can provide provincials and some uh, credentials and headers or the, you know, the, the, uh, on the actual command itself. So again, on here, I'm just doing a real simple Git, but even in before this, uh, let's say you opened it, made it even a larger, uh, had a larger PowerShell script or acting, you could set up variables that do provide credentials, authorization header, stuff like that. Um, even the newer version, HTTP client, and even the invoke web web request that I mentioned, you can go even further. But again, for this one, um, yes, it does have that capability. So, yeah. And so, uh, uh, if you're downloading a file, I realize here that you, you know, you the 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 file that you downloaded was pretty small. But if you opted to download something that was pretty large, I'm assuming that when you run this command, it's going to sort of look like the command kind of halted. No, no, yeah, I think, you know, is, is it, you know, is it, is it going to bring back the command prompt right away while the file is downloading? Or is it wait before it gives you the command prompt until after the file is completely downloaded? Exactly the latter. Another great question, Manny, too, on that. Yeah. So, yeah, you do wait. I didn't, you, there's an async mode or synchronous mode. So, this, yeah, you will have to wait on this. And if the file is too large, um, you will, some, you can get errors because you would then would have to put in some wait states or dispose of the original connection once it's done as it splits that file up. So, okay. you know, like I say, yeah. So, but that is a great question because here, like I say, t today, you know, just showing the ability to do this. So if you were taking this, as you say, further, you'd want to research more so to say, OK, you know, yeah, I have a larger file. You may have to dispose of the original connection, like I mentioned, or because it is synchronous, you can change it to an async type. There are parameters you can add to this to do that. All right. So continuing uh, with our fourth command out of five today, we're going to be covering the uh, file list download. 
And again, one liner, <laughs> it's going to basically use to download and execute in memory. So whereas on our last command, we actually download a file and wrote it to disk, what we're gonna do here is use the invoke expression and invoke web request to download a particular um, file. Um, it could be from an HTTP um, protocol or uh, scheme. Um, and then it's going to run in memory and it's not going to actually save that down to disk. So what I'm going to use today, though, is going to just be a file command on my local computer. But just to show you the context, you can uh, apply what you need or whatever purpose you need um, as you're using this command um, other than file, which, again, I'm going to show on the demo shortly. But uh, yeah, so basically it's just uh, take the web request, put in your particular URI or the resource that you want to um, have basically downloaded and ran, and then it's going to invoke that. So first, again, it's going to um, request the resource and the evoke expression is going to actually run that particular resource. So pretty simple in, in its execution. OK, so now in our demo for this one, again, this is the file list download. Um, as I explained, it's just going to I'm going to use a file command. I mean, you could put HTTP or HTTPS in here, but just for our sake of our discussion today in the context show, I'm going to use the file command and then I have a I'm going to tell you what, let me stop this real quick and let me just um, do a DR. And what we'll do is we'll show you what um, PS1 is. Basically, it's just DR. So what I'm going to do is basically uh, request a DR of this current or local directory. What it does, again, is the fact that this, the strength of this command or this is the ability to not have to download this particular uh, PowerShell script down to an actual file. Like we did on the last command with the download file, we actually download that channel PDF to my local computer here. Everything's going to be basically done in memory. So again, when I run this, all it's going to do is basically reference that file. And within the PS1 that I just showed the type command, it's going to just to do a DIR or directory of my listing of my current directory. And that's it. So again, let me run it one more time just so you get the nature of it. So um, these are the files here. I'm going to run that command. And again, it did run this particular PowerShell command. That PowerShell command just did a DRR or directory listing in my current directory. Nothing was downloaded as like the last command we saw where I, we actually physically download the PDF file. It's stored locally. This was all done in memory. Yeah, the advantage here for somebody like a pen tester is that if you're yes. trying to get your code, your malicious code onto a system that might be watching the write to disk, maybe that's where the AV is spending its time looking. Yeah. Uh, if you don't write to disk, it may not see it. You have a better chance of, of not being caught in this case. Am I right? No, I don't really have much to expand on that because, yeah, because it's really it's exactly yeah how it is. So, and again, that's the strength of this, you know, command, you know, and as you say, I'm sure pen testers would have probably, uh, everyone could have a use for it. But again, pen testers, especially, as you mentioned, Matt, you know, have a really good use for this. So for our fifth and final command, what we're going to be covering is um, it's a command or, well, it's part of a command, but it's a stream or switch or parameter that we're going to add to the get item command that basically lets us see into alternate data streams. Now, um, alternate data streams have been around for a while. Um, you know, there's been different, you know, uses and, and malicious activity. And, you know, some of the people who are newer, let's say, to the security community or uh, just not starting out may not be familiar with alternate data streams because, like I mentioned, they've been around for quite some time. Um, and, you know, they are used. So they used to originally thought, you know, a lot of malicious activity, but they are used. Like if you save some like your summary or description uh, items into certain documents, let's say, in, I think in Word, uh, it'll actually put an alternate data stream. So there are good uses for data streams. But what happened is they did get a, a bad rep or rap per se because um, it has been taken to that malicious activity level to where um, the commands or the stream was used to hide either documents or text files, or even in some cases, add an actual executable that can be ran um, that only looked like a text file, but when you actually uh, run the specific command, it'll actually uh, execute an executable instead of a text document. Now for today, I'm not gonna an actual sh run an executable. I do have one I'll show that will show you the executable within the stream, but um, we're not gonna be running any today. We're just going to be running the stream parameter and just show that you can see that there is an alternate data stream within the, the file itself. And how that looks, for the command is we're going to a get item. Um, you can specify a path, but since I'm working in the same directory today, I'm not. I'm just going to dot slash to reference locally. Um, but again, you can put the path, and again, path being where the file actually resides, um, and then <clears throat> the uh, the file name itself. And then this is the uh, part of the command for today uh, that we're focused on is the stream star uh, parameter. So what we'll do is, um, and like I say, I have it listed here, just kind of a quick uh, description of, of what each does. 
And again, this is pretty simple when you see it, uh, basically what's happening and um, there's not a whole lot to it, real simple. So I've got two files in here. One's called ads.txt, one's called adsfile.txt. The first one, what we have in here, and, I'll, and again, I'll show you, is just, it looks like a zero byte file, a text file um, with nothing in it, but there's actually a stream in here with additional um, verbiage or wording. So I'll run the command and then I'll explain um, what we're seeing. Um, so <clears throat> again, as I mentioned, you can put the path here. I can run it with both ways, but you don't have to have the path. You could reference with the dot uh, forward slash and I can show that, or just the file name itself. You don't have to do the, the dash path switch or optional parameter. So when we run this command, <clears throat> what we're gonna see is here's the original file, uh, ads.txt. Um, with the zero bytes, right? Length of zero bytes as we see up here at the top of the screen. Now, however, we do see something when we notice when we run this command or this stream command, we actually see uh, colon and demo. That is basically telling us that there's an alternate data stream attached to this particular file. Um, the name of that data stream is demo and it's 16 bytes in length. So David, how much legitimate use, like you said, there, there is legitimate use of ADS. Um, how much legitimate use though? I mean, would it be uh, a valid tactic to say anytime you see the use of ADS, you should be firing some sort of alert to your SOC? Oh yeah, no question at all whatsoever. I mean, yeah, there's no question. Anytime you see these, because again, most people, even I had, I even, I was a little, uh, you know, surprised that it's kind of used, like say, when we put in description fields and summaries, because that's just an area, you know, when you save a document or something, you don't really look at that per se, or, you know, it's not really something you uh, focus on, but no question, Matt, on this, if you see a, an ADS come in, yeah, it should instantly go to a SOC so they can definitely investigate because, uh, like I say, these have been around for a while. I mean, I know there may not be used as much as they used to be when it first came out, but this capability still exists and, you know, no question because this you know, the text file is bad enough, right? Maybe some instructions or anything, but once you start applying an actual executable to that, and you know, you think that it's just a text file and the way the commands ran to sh run that, then here is where the malicious activity is actually gonna take place or ran or run. So that is the key here and why these, as you say, are, yeah, no question, instantly go to your stock or have a analysis done for sure. Well, I guess the second question is, is it possible to completely disable these? across your environment, like deny the use of alternate data streams. Yeah, Matt, so you can definitely, you know, uh, you know, one way is, you know, you can definitely, um, you know, stop these from, you know, being created. So one of the ways just right off the bat is, right, just, I mean, I know it's a simple thing, but is prevent access to the command prompt, right? So that's where some of these are done. Now, I know there's other ways to do that, but that is one way is just deny access. And, you know, a lot of people um, who aren't admin or who don't have admin privileges, do have that revoked in most environments, right? That's not an area to where they're going to have command prompt access. But yeah, so I mean, so that was our, you know, our, our demo here on this. Um, again, um, these have been around for a while. They're still valid. Um, again, as Matt, your question, there are ways, you know, to capture these, prevent them, or even, uh, you know, I'm sure, I think there's there's pieces of other software out there that you can apply uh, to check these if you didn't use PowerShell, but. Uh, again, it's just a point to, you know, uh, bring home again that this does exist and, you know, it is still a, a, a threat that does uh, reside out there. Again, maybe not as prevalent as it used to be when these first came out, but uh, again, it does exist today. So, David, uh, appreciate it. Uh, those were uh, pretty uh, interesting uh, commands that you've uh, taught, and I think this was a pretty successful change in sort of the format for threat track. So again, appreciate it. I think uh, good information there. And I think we'll switch over now to Matt, who's gonna give us a little bit of the internet weather. Okay, let's take a look, a very short look at this week's internet weather. We'll just hit a few ports this week and not go through the top 10 as we usually do. So some of the ones that were interesting to me this week was actually um, port 9010. Um, TCP, which is related to there's something called Hikvision's EasyViz. Uh, I did a little bit of reading about this port. Um, it seems it is a characteristic port of certain uh, Hikvision devices, and that it's it's something you could, if you wanted to find a particular model, scan for it and find this exposed. And at some point, this was a port that when you would um, put a Hikvision device on your network, if um, universal plug and play was enabled, uh, it would try and open this out to the outside world. Uh, which is never a good thing. In fact, I, I think most most of us have, have turned off UPnP um, in general just because we don't we don't want to be exposing ports that we don't have direct control over or direct knowledge of. 
But anyway, this was in the 13th place, which would have not have made it up into my, my top 10. But since it moved by four, I figure it was worth covering. And this is, uh, it's gone up four rankings in the number of source IPs probic for it. Um, so again, possibly scanning for vulnerable devices that are built by Hikvision. Uh, there were some major vulnerabilities reported for Hikvision manufactured devices in 2021 and 2017. So the, not too far out of the realm of possibility. Uh, the peak that you see on the far right, most of the sources for that peak are at a single ISP within the U.S. I was unable to confirm whether or not Hikvision is some sort of spe specific device to those provide to this this provider, um, but it wouldn't be uh, out of the realm of possibility either. We have seen cases in which uh, ISPs uh, seem to be the sources for a lot of scanning because they have a large population of a particular vendor's vulnerable device. Uh, this would be, I think, the first time I've seen it in a U.S. ISP, um, but certainly something interesting. Any thoughts, guys? Yeah, Matt, you said, uh, said most of us in the U.S. Have we seen it before, like coming from other areas? I mean, I know it can come anywhere all the time, but I mean, it looks like the like you said, the concentration right now is mainly U.S. But um, is it has it been seen any large around you know other places around the world or um, mm -hmm. in past? I mean, that's a great question. Uh, I haven't gone investigating the different yeah. spikes that we've seen in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so I, don't, I really can't answer that for you right here on the air. Um, I'm sure if we had a look at it, though, we would probably have seen a decent amount of scanning from places outside of the U.S. Uh, I just don't have the numbers on, in terms of like any major upticks. Yeah, I should know if like maybe that maybe Higbee's was something new, like you know it was external before into the world, and now it's being more utilized more here. Maybe you could tie it to back to yeah something like that. So okay, yeah, good question. Good yeah. question. I, I assume uh, Matt that the. Uh... The gap that looks like it happened somewhere around is that's not when the internet went down right is, is no. that just uh... so it, as a as a way of segueing into our next slide actually uh you will see that that same gap appears uh, precisely at the same time on both of my slides <laughs> that's actually a, a gap in our data and not a malfunctioning of the entire internet um, gotcha. which i'm sure would have been much more interesting to talk about i just it's just a data issue so okay apologies for that um the, the second port that we're going to talk about today is one that we have talked about on the show before. That's uh, 5555 TCP, Android Remote Debug Bridge. Uh, this is a port that if someone um, likes to mess around with Android devices, uh, they may have encountered at some point. It was very popular to use this as a way of, of jailbreaking Android devices like Android TV boxes uh, so that you could sideload different APK files onto it and run things that weren't necessarily uh, part of the approved app store. Um, the instructions that were put on the internet for these things apparently did not include the step of closing this port again when they were done. Uh, and for a while, it was very popular to uh, to reach into these things and exploit them remotely. So this, this was 11th place overall by flows, and it's gone up by seven spots. Uh, again, some of this might be a result of that, that gap in our data affecting the calculations. Um, some of it may not be. And again, the movement in that that chart that we see the top 10 usually doesn't necessarily reflect a major uptick in a single port. It may also be the culmination of several other ports in the ranking decreasing. Now, I don't have the numbers to say which this is. Um, I mean, someone has the numbers. I don't have the numbers today, but um, that's just something to keep in mind. And so the, the largest contributors to the spike that you see on the far right here are uh, three sources in Vietnam and a single source in the Netherlands. Uh, so not you know tied to any one particular place. But again, when you see um, a change like this, to know that four sources have contributed to a major uptick is, is sort of interesting. It means you've got some population that's very small and very dedicated to scanning for a particular port. If it were a, a corresponding uptick in both the number of sources and the amount of scans, um, maybe a less, maybe it would be more interesting from a, a botnet perspective. Here, it seems to be that there's just a, a small population that's very interested for some reason in this port. Could be some sort of internet survey project, could be a university or someone's individual research project. Almost certainly not or at least less likely to be uh, the results of botnet activity. 
you know, I guess you could do some like some OSN if you really wanted to, right? To do like you say to see if that community or population is small. Maybe it's coming from a, a small city. Maybe you could kind of be interesting to see, right? Like mm -hmm. if it's a uh, or going back like we in previous, if we could tell, you know, if it was something from a, a, a single group, right? Maybe that's their location or you know something like that. Obviously, they're going to be sure. you know probably a little more skilled than that. But the point is, you know, being able to see or, or pinpoint or tie that back to uh, an area or a community or a demographic or a, an area or geography of the country. Yep. Yeah, or or a type of network connection. I mean, we can we can determine yes. that you know does this belong to an ISP where it's a bunch of you know um, regular customers of theirs who just have like you know cable modems connected to the internet, or is this at a hosting provider somewhere? Has someone set up a, a virtual private server for the purpose of scanning, or is it something completely wacky? Is it some sort of cellular range? Is it some sort of range that's known to be part of satellite modems? Like there's there's all sorts of things that we've seen in the past that are, are very like, well, what the heck is that about? Um, but unfortunately, I don't have too many details on those particular ranges and the, the sources, only that I have that their, their location this time around. Mm -hmm.